as a strategist uh, in the industry, I think one of the things we do is perhaps see the industry a bit differently, uh, maybe from a different perspective. But in my opinion, the industry has had cracks in the foundation for a long time. In 1988, as the National Golf Foundation said we needed to build a golf course a day between then and the year 2000, largely we did that. Unfortunately, about 93% of them were daily fees, uh, representing a huge uh, imposition on all of us in the private club industry. Uh, we have so many other issues, and so all of a sudden we have lack of leisure time. Most of you are learning in, in your clubs that lack of leisure time. Leisure time itself is almost as a great a commodity as the dollar. Because if I can't justify the amount of time that I might spend at your clubs, uh, I'm certainly not going to spend the money to be a member of your club. Which means one of the terms that I heard this morning from David was relevance. Relevance is a key issue. And as we'll go through this presentation rather quickly, uh, because Jay said that if I don't finish by 1245, I'll never be asked to you know, come back, so I'll try to do that. The other problem, of course, that we have is that in 2008 we had a recession, and so the confluence of all of these issues of, of lack of leisure time, a changing culture, a younger generation that has different wants and needs, combining with a recession was the perfect storm that all of a sudden everybody opened their eyes and said, oh, we could be in trouble. It's been going on for a long time. So what I'd like to do today is kind of just walk you through what I think is somewhat of a whimsical, in some cases, but in my mind, factual overview of where this industry is. The collective challenge. The assumption that the, the, the path to the future is a series of incremental steps from the past. In a lot of respects, when you look around, particularly in the East Coast, and I work globally, so I get a chance to see different areas of the country. This is probably one of the last bastions of a truly traditional, almost a stoic traditional value as to what you have in your clubs. And it's not a bad thing. It's simply that we have a younger generation now that is coming up and saying to you and to me and to the industry, maybe we want something else. Maybe we need to make another choice. Maybe we, we need to look at other things. Uh, what happens when you walk in a new club for the first time? For me, having been in nearly 3,000 private clubs in, in, in my career, it's, a, it's almost a deja vu. Every time I walk in, I see the same thing. And again, David pointed it out. We've got a golf course, we've got a clubhouse, we've got a swimming pool, we've got tennis courts. But what's the intangible that we have? What are we selling out there that makes us relevant in your member's life? And who is your potential member? We should never forget that it's probably within 15 minutes drive of your, of your club, period. It's not much more than that, and in most cases it's less. And if you're positioned not for that market, then your relevance in that community is not going to be there. You can see this cartoon that says, yes, Scott, if all your friends jump off a cliff, then you should too. It's called Parenting for Lemmings. <coughs> So why are we so consumed, and I hear this at every single boardroom that I go into, what's the club down the street doing? What, what, what are they doing? Who cares what they're doing? They're in trouble too. Should we follow them off the edge of the cliff? And the answer is maybe it's time for us to start looking forward. And part of that forward is, is as Charlie Rose was interviewing Warren Buffett one day, he said, uh, he said, Warren, he said, what's the problem with the world today? And he was really talking about the economy, but I'm paraphrasing here for our own industry. He said, well, Charlie, he says it's the three eyes. First of all, it's the innovators. He said, we have a lot of innovators out there, and they bring new things to the, to the table. And look around clubs, how many innovators are there? And he says, then what happens is we have the imitators. We have those that will follow and do everything that everybody else is doing. And then pretty soon we get into the third stage, which, which is idiocy. And you have to ask yourself sometimes, where are we in this process as an industry? We have not followed what the people are asking us to do out there. In so many cases, as I go around the world, how can I walk in as a, as a marketer, as a strategist, into a club and suddenly they get 80 members? where they weren't able to get but maybe 20 members a year previously. 
because you read the market and you ask what it is that that market wants and needs, and then you deliver it. It's about strategic thinking. I think this is one of the most compelling uh, statements that I've read in a long time. How can you rediscover and reinterpret what's come before as a way to develop an original and compelling line of sight into what comes next? Interesting. Working off the tradition, working off the history, but developing something that's out there as a club of the future. What does the club of the future look like? Is it going to be different in New York than it is in Miami? Is it going to be different in Miami than it is in California or Chicago or Dallas? And the answer is probably no. They're going to be very, very similar. But they are going to be different. We'll always have the Westchesters of the world because they are defined by density of wealth and lack of very significant competition. Those clubs will always survive in that mode. But the rest of the clubs out there in the world today are going to have to compete on, a, on somewhat of a, comp uh, of a different playing field. I, I could actually spend a whole day on that particular line because I think it has so much uh, to say. Original and compelling requires the alignment with, with, within the organization. What does that mean? Certainly it means a collaborative vision. It means alignment. If I have a board that's sitting over here, and I've got a general manager that's sitting over here, and department heads that are sitting over here, I'm, I'm not in alignment. I can't deliver on the promise that I'm trying to make and deliver to my members. It's mission. It's strategy. It's a tactical process of having everybody on that team seeing from the same set of eyes and trying to deliver on that same promise. If you're not delivering at the base, at the brilliance at the basics, you're, you're affecting any other strategy that you might be able to employ. Is it consistent? Every time a member walks into your club, is it a consistent level of service that they're receiving? Do they walk out and be positive ambassadors of your club? I recently took my three girls to uh, Laguna Beach to a, a hotel down there. The day before we went down, they called us and they said, uh, tell us who's in your party, what time you expect to arrive, what kind of car you're driving, what are the names and ages in your party? And I thought, that's really, that's going a little too far. You can't know about it. I don't want to give you all that information. But I realized that I gave it to them. And we arrived the next afternoon at 7.30, or the evening at 7.30. They opened my car door, said, Mr. Coyne, how nice to have you with us. Opened the car door behind me where my 12-year-old was sitting and said, Shannon, we're so glad to have you. We're going to have some fun. And so Shannon beams and jumps out. Of course, they said hello to my other two daughters as well by name. And they marched in as I was handing over the keys to the, to the guy in the driveway. Well, you can imagine the impact that that had on my children. And, and while it was it's some good news and some bad news, the good news was it, was it was such an experience that they'll never forget. The bad news is they won't stay in the place with the montage, which is about $400 tonight. <laughs> so the, the issue here is that the cream rises to the top, but the, the fish rots from the head down. So if we're not in alignment all the way, walk into a club sometime and see a, a, a server and, and look at a server. And in some cases, you can actually identify the personality of the GM. If it's a server, here he is, here's your food. And you walk in and meet the manager, yeah, what do you want? I don't have any time for you. And, and sometimes it goes all the way up to the board. You see it all the way down that level. It is the alignment sometimes that causes us the most amount of problems. And so now we get from that board, whoops. <laughs> my children gave me a, a map for my 65th birthday, and I've had it now for seven days, so I, I apologize for any messes. So the, the, the management, staff, and leadership, keeping everybody at that level on the same page. How many of you have the COO, form of government, versus the three-legged stool? I'm dealing with a club right now that has the three-legged stool that is absolutely the most screwed up environment I've ever seen in my life. Fiefdom after fiefdom after fiefdom, fighting for the money, fighting for the power, fighting for what, I mean, it, it's amazing. I don't know how many of you know Michael McCarthy, and a lot of the GMs do. Great story. Members took over the club from the developer. Within five years, their dues doubled. They lost their greens. 
Their annual turnover of employees was about 96% a year. Three quarters of the members were on the committees. And so the new GM came in, and uh, albeit it's a great story, he ended up with a seven or eight year no cut contract, which is the only way I would suggest anybody go at this thing. But the first thing he did, first day, was cut all the committees. They've held the dues line now for about six or seven years. Everything is running smoothly. Why? Because this is a specialized industry that requi requires specialized management and skills. And if, if you don't think you have the right people in there, get rid of them, but don't try to run it for them on a day-to-day -day basis. We get down to the line staff. Here's a great list, litmus test. Walk, walk into a club, even your own, although you, you're the leaders in your clubs, you probably won't get the response I will, and ask, say, I just read something in the e-newsletter from Steve, and it says uh, this about this event. Can you tell me about it? You know what the response you'll get most of the time? I don't know what they are doing. Now, I don't know is bad enough in my mind because it means there's no sharing. But what they are doing, they absolutely connotates a disconnect on that level. And so how many, how many times do we have a disconnect on this level? And then, of course, if you're not from the board to the management to the line staff, if we're not in alignment, how do we deliver all the promise to this member? And that member then talks about it to the community. And by the way, those, those kids that we just showed, that's are mom's little, uh, little ducklings. And as you probably all know, if mama isn't happy, everybody's going to hear about it. 85%, according to the last NCA publication, of major buying decisions are made by the female in the household. And that means that people are making decisions on a much different basis today than they were before. As I might have told you the last time I was here, 20 years ago, I might have walked into a club and had lunch, played some golf, afterwards said, wow, what a great place, give me an application, fill it out, put it through to the membership committee, and let's go. Um, and I'd have gone home that night, and I said to my wife, Donna, honey, we just joined the XYZ Club. And she says, oh, isn't that great that you found a place to spend four and a half hours of your time on Saturday while I watch the kids? I guarantee you that would be a completely different conversation today. And it's a completely different conversation today anywhere in USA. Which means that if we're not trying to sell to that young mother who has children and is worrying about the lack of leisure time and what's going to be in it for her, that single male head of household who traditionally made the decision to join the club may not be able to do so because we are not, as males today, making all of those decisions. So what happens is, this is called community perception. This is about the relevance. This is about the identity of what our clubs are. And your value is, is predicated upon that community perception. If you don't have relevance to that 15 minute drive time area, you're not gonna sell many memberships, no matter whether you diminish the price or you don't diminish the price. So what happens if we continue to lose market share? Obviously, the costs are passed on to those that remain. How many of you have seen a, a, a major increase in memberships over the past five years? How many of you are staying even? How many of you are seeing some declines? Okay, either somebody's not being uh, honest or you're falling asleep. But <laughs> the, uh, most clubs today, as you will see looking at your own statistics here, if we're gaining in membership, why are we seeing initiation fees go down over the past three years? Seeing dues go up, initiation fees go down. That's a pretty good indicator that we're not doing as well in membership as we would like to. So what happens? Service reductions, dues increases, assessments. And never forget the story of a club that we had in, in uh, uh, Michigan several years ago. These are all guys who came from GM and Ford. And boy, when the economy went bad, they said, by God, we'll just cut the line, we'll lay people off. By the way, those people who got laid off still got paid 100% of their salaries, but didn't, uh, that was another story. Um, where was I? Anyway, so this guy, he's listening to this from his board members every day. And, and so they're saying, cut, 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 cut. 
And he says, well, wait a minute, we're in the club business. If we cut, 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 everybody's the, the existing members would say, well, that's not what I joined for. I'm not, I don't have the same things that I had if you're taking it away from me. And to the new people who are looking at joining, they're saying, oh, that's not all that attractive. So, I don't, so anyway, he's trying to rationale with the board and say, God, we can't do that. So every time he goes down to the, to the men's grill every day, he says, have you found a way to cut some, some expenses, Kurt? And they said, no, sorry, sir, I haven't. Finally, one day he walks down there and he says, they said, Kurt, have you found something to, to cut? And he said, yes, yes, sir, I have. He says, uh, but it's kind of good news, bad news. He said, what's the good news? He said, the good news is I found a way to cut $200,000 a year. Good boy, Kurt, we knew you could do it. He said, what's the bad news? <clears throat> We're closing the men's grill. And I think it's going to happen. So what happens when, we, when these things happen? It becomes the death spiral. We, we continue to lose more members and we, we start to be less attractive. Here's some manifestations very quickly. Here's stability. Here's a problem. And these are, these are real numbers. I can't make this stuff up. Uh, these are real clubs. There's only one slide in here that is not. Look at the, look at the first one here. 721 down to 664. Now look at the resulting financial difference. In three years, a club went from 700,000 positive to 23,000 negative. It's pretty sad. <coughs> now, the initiation fees, we see this all the time, initiation fees going down. And, and you know, again, it could be an hour discussion. Where do we get to these initiation fees? You can ask a half a dozen clubs, and I say, well, I don't know. Uh, Jimmy went to Las Vegas, and he saw a club that wasn't half as nice as ours, and they were getting 75,000, so we go going to charge 125. It's, a, you know, it's easy. So we, we've gotten there on all the wrong reasons. Our marketplace, 15 minutes drive time from us, will tell us what we should be charging. So when the initiation fees are going down, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. You can pay zero initiation fee now, but where are you going to get the capital? Where are you going to get the capital a few years from now that you're going to have to pump back into this place? You don't have the revenues because you're losing members. So it... it this whole idea of lowering initiation fees to almost zero and, and trying to play this game on price alone is lunacy. As we look at age segmentation, age segmentation is important to us. We often ask the question, what's the, can you tell us about the age of your, your members? And most clubs will tell us, well, the average age is 56 years old. Some will say it's, it's 62 or someone will say it's 71. The average doesn't matter. The segmentation matters because when you look over in that far right-hand corner, and this is not a real club, this is just to show you what a balance would be, you look at that right-hand corner and you see it looks from a, a ski slope from there down to the younger members, that's a problem. Because a 6 to 8% normal attrition that you should have on an annual basis is now going to find itself to 12 to 14%, which means your replenishment problem is increasing dramatically. We're dying to get in at that younger age. Do you have a program for the younger people? It, we should have programs, whether they're legacy programs or they're tier step ways for them to pay the initiation fee and dues. If you don't think that's right, I invite you to go to any company that provides economic data on a community and find out what their net worth is in your community by age. Find out what their income is by age. And what you'll see is a similar spike to this, that it peaks around 55 to 64, net income, or net worth rather, and income. And so along the way, we should be, we should be providing a pathway, a segue for our young people, young families to get into our clubs. The other part of that is that that becomes a great parking lot membership to upgrade to full. We all, how many times have you heard in your own boardroom or locker rooms that, oh my God, that secondary membership, we don't need those people, they don't spend any money. I mean, the golf people are spending all the money, right? I can show you clubs all over the country that have learned that if I can get them in there and I get my pro staff engaged, I can use that as a parking lot to start upgrading, get them in early, commit them, and then drive them into a full membership later. And of course, when they're over there in the 75, they're dying to get out. So, we're at a crossroad. More of the same, or the vision, courage to change. My opinion, it's courage. 
Um, you know, I used to think that I would evolve as I grew into what my father was. And it's not so. I've maintained my set of cultural wants and needs throughout my life. My children will never become me either, and their children will never become them. And so as we, I think at one time, considered ourselves a very homogeneous society, we are now individual cultures traveling through life, which means clubs need to adapt to those individual cultures. It's not by diminishment that we say this, that we should say, okay, forget the seniors. Although, frankly, most, and I'm a senior now, so I can say this, um, they won't be around forever. But if you look and see who your member was that joined over the last seven or eight years, that's going to give you one of the, the best crystal balls as to what your next market's going to look like. Look at their age demographic and look at their family makeup. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Um, one of the earlier slides from one of the earlier speakers talked about this. But as you see, these are the Gen Xers on the left, the baby boomers in the middle, and the matures on the right. And you see on the basis of hundreds of surveys that we've done, uh, sorry, I told you, kids give me a toy and I can't figure it out. Uh, what you find here is that golf held a very high position relative to importance by age. It got a little bit less important for the baby boomer, and it got even less important for that Gen Xer. Maybe because the wife is making the decision, maybe not, but that's the way the surveys came out. Most of our recent surveys suggest to us that, for example, the two clubs that we did in North Carolina recently, that golf was number seven is the reason for joining the club. That's distressing. That's very disturbing. And if we, so, if, but if that's the case, and we did that in your own club, over, over the, the people who joined over the last seven or eight years, and that was their answer, would that point us in a direction that maybe we should all be thinking about going and how we position ourselves in our marketplaces? Much more towards a, a more inclusive membership. Okay, so how are you perceived? Beer drinking, gamblers hanging out in the locker room, plotting the demise of the general manager? <laughs> See, I've been in that locker room too. I know those guys. Uh, little grandma sitting around playing bingo or bridge all day, complaining about the size and portion of, of the food and drinks. I can say this one too, Steve. You couldn't have gotten away with this, but I can. Holding tank for the undertaker. <laughs> Golf, golf, nothing but golf. Or a well-rounded family environment catering to the needs of multiple generations. Which should it be? The answer to me is pretty obvious. What your members look like. You got any of these? We love the club and all our friends are there, but we're not even buying green bananas, so don't scrap us with renovations we'll never use. This is the young family. I don't have much leisure time, and when I do, I want it to be special time for my family. Remember these girls? Hey, whatever happened to those black tie events and formal dining? I even saw some members in here in jeans. Oh my! Can we Twitter? Now, I'll tell you, in the last several years, we've seen this whole social media thing go crazy, and clubs that are doing it. Uh, as particularly as Steve pointed out, one publication, multiple venues, it, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Golf, child centricity is a key to today's child rearing generation. And by the way, here's mom again. I took that uh, out at your pool, Bob, that center one, just last night. Uh, to remain relevant, we must address each generation's needs, paying close attention to the most recent demographic. And again, one easy takeaway from this session is this. If, if you look to see what your members look like that have joined over the past seven, eight years, it's going to be a, a, an absolute crystal ball to what your next generation of members is going to be. This is what I, I believe it will look like. If you looked at, and this is an actual club, 
that most of them are going to be under the age of 55. As a matter of fact, uh, in most of our clubs that we do these kinds of surveys, 90% of the new members are under the age of 55. Most of them with some sort of family living at home, which is illustrated in this next slide. Now, in five years, think about the culture of this younger member coming in and think about the culture of all those children coming in. That, that has the capacity of really changing things very significantly to the rest of the members. And, and also very, very much from the standpoint of what you as a club need to offer in order to continue that pipeline flowing. Where are your members spending their money now? Uh, it's, it's about being, again, relevant to what they need. Dress codes. How many of you allow denims? Who was against it? When you put it into place, who was against it? The older members. The older members, really? <laughs> and how long did they say they're going to be around that? Dining. Dining. I mean, you know what? I, I heard that, that David, and, and I don't mean anything negative by this, but when you look at a dining room like this, I say to myself, uh -uh, I ain't eating here every night. This is a nice place, and I'll tell you what, I will remember this place and talk about this place, Bob, every place I go. What a wonderful venue. But I am not eating here every night. Remember this lady? How many of you have booths in your dining room? How many, how many of you, there, one, is it utilized? Big time, right? How many places that your members are going to eat have booths? Something silly like that. So when you're doing your renovations, are we thinking about these things? We had a club down in, in uh, Dallas. We lived there for almost 30 years. They, uh, they did a complete renovation, complete teardown, and rebuild. The new building was exactly the same way the old building was. It was even decorated, same color, same carpet, everything. It was quite a renovation. <laughs> As cultures change, venues do likewise. So here's your typical country club environment. Um, I'm not pointing any fingers, but I did take these yesterday. So. And then here's some of the places that probably your members are going out to dine. Loved it last night. Of course, Steve has a, uh, a nose for bars, and he said, let's meet for a bar. And we ended up in Bob's sports bar last night. Did anyone get a chance to go down there and see the place? Marvelous place, a great hangout, and that's it's kind of like Cheers. That's where people want to go. Then we walked out to the patio to eat, and we walked through the next little bar area, and it was the more sedate kind of formal, and there were three or four people in there. The bar was full, sedate, not so full. It should be telling you something. People want to have fun. How about a sports bar? We just finished doing a club again, and I was telling you, in North Carolina, working with their um, architects. We suggested, how about an ice cream parlor? This this particular club was a was a ever all the members lived within a contiguous zip code within five minutes. It was a walk to, a bicycle ride to. Where are all these new? What are these new ideas that we can we can instill into the club of the future? Sports bars, all the things that our members are doing for every sporting event that goes on. Why not have them at our club? Okay, creating relevance that we've talked about here is, is not about the membership director, it's not about the GM, it's a team sport. Every person on that staff needs to be engaged and involved. Dick Cotton, who's a, a placement guy in the, in the industry, says that our members are touched an average of 32 times every time they come into the club. Each one of those touches is a moment of truth. Each, each one of those touches sends somebody out with a perception that they will spread and talk about within the community, which then implies how you are going to be perceived in that community. Market positioning is, is really a choice, and I, I want to take you through this. And I think you have this in the back of your uh, uh, books. I wrote two recent articles for Boardroom Magazine. You can look at these. Look carefully at industry trends. We call them industry trends because that's what they are, and you're part of the industry. If, you're, if you think you're outside of that norm, you're probably not. Clearly understand your market. Does everyone believe me that you're 
Drive time is probably about 15 minutes from your door, and that's what your market is. It's very easily definable. If you don't believe that, look and do a zip code analysis of where your existing members live, and then plot that on a zip code map. And then if you want to really drill down into that, what you want to do is you want to go back and, and go to somebody like ESRI.com and order the demographics for that area. Order age by income, order net worth, order a map so that you can see where these people are coming from. You get a chance to see the family makeup of these individuals. You get a chance to see their ages. You get a chance to see their incomes. You get a chance to see their net worths. Are you positioned for that marketplace? If it's a, as an example, we got a call several years ago from a banker in, in Charlotte said, would you go take a look at this club for us called Red Fox? It was in just over the South Carolina border in North Carolina. He said, we're losing about 12 members a month. And I said, sure, we'll go up there. So we went in and the, the place looked gorgeous. It was a wonderful property. Um, rolling hills and smoky streams running through it, almost a curry or an Ives kind of look. Clubhouse was small but nice. Staff was gracious. Couldn't find anything physically, at least outwardly, that we could find that was wrong. But as we began to look at the, the books, we found that the average age of the membership was like 78. So it wasn't the resignations that they were getting, it was a much more permanent departure. <laughs> You can find this kind of stuff out by just looking internally. So understanding your market. Yeah. Where do your members live? What price can you price your product at logically? And we had a club in the East Bay of San Francisco several years ago, ran their initiation fee from 27,500 to 85,000 in a period of five years. And we asked the board why. And they said, well, we had people sitting on the fence post. They weren't, they weren't stepping up to buy. And so what we said was, we're going to raise it from 27.5 to 36 on June 1st. And so everybody that was on the fence post came in and joined. So it was, seemed plausible, right? Of course, they got up to 85,000 and they didn't sell a membership for two years. Why? Because there was nobody within even a 40-mile radius that could have afforded the 85,000 in this particular marketplace. And so it, it, it really is all about market, how you set up your categories, how you set up all of the things. It's finite predictable. How are you perceived in your market, as we talked about a second ago? Beer drinkers, gamblers, uh, stoic, old, uh, very formal. And then you look at your marketplace and you find it's all young families. Is that proper position? Probably not. All indicators, and here I am at the Med Golf Association telling you, all indicators say that Golf is on the decline. Rounds are down. Uh, number of golfers are down. Uh, there's, I just read the, the latest stuff from NGF yesterday, and there really isn't anything on the horizon to suggest that that's going to change. As a matter of fact, if anything, if you look at the next generations, which are much smaller than the baby boomer generation, there, 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 is, there should be a natural continued decline. So that would suggest to me, as a, again, as a strategist, that if we are building our business only on the strength of our golf, I'm not saying diminish it, it's not, it's not at all what I'm saying. If we're building the continued growth of our businesses only on golf, then I think we're A, missing a grand opportunity, but B, perhaps marching down a path that it doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense as we look at the generational differences that are ahead. Um, what are you doing about golf being on the, on the decline. How many of you have uh, secondary memberships like sports or tennis? How many of you have only one membership, golf? Okay. You're, we're finding a lot of the clubs today that are looking at secondary memberships, obviously the difficulty when you have one membership in-house and then you go to a second membership, you find out that there's about 50% of your members want to downgrade to that membership because they're not quite playing golf that much anyway, so you have to be very careful. Your club's perception is, if your club's perception is not parallel to what your market tells you, it should be. Here's where, here's where the courage comes in. You know, there's, there's nothing in this presentation today, really, that I've given you that is something you probably don't already know. But have you had the courage to face those decisions and the will to make the change? And as I was 
we had a conference in Chicago a couple of weeks ago with our professional club marketing association. And that was one of the things that in, in our roundtables kept coming up. We've got the plan. We know what the market is telling us to do, but we can't seem to get the decision makers to move in the direction we need for them to move. Secondary memberships can be huge, as I said. They can be a parking lot. They can be a way to accumulate that younger member who has the up-and-coming attitude and money and bring them into the club in some way that you can then upgrade them to a regular membership. If you believe that leisure time is an absolute issue, then you must believe that people today are not joining the club because they don't have that leisure time at the expense of a current golf membership. Give them a choice, give them another opportunity to come in, and you may see that you can get a lot of that younger market geared up to you before they go out and find daily fee answers their need for golf. Get the pro staff engaged. That, that, that whole parking lot issue doesn't work unless your, your pro staff is engaged. We're working with Country Club of Fairfax in a, a recent article, and I think it's in the back of your books there, uh, talks about the pro staff engaging and trying to get the non-golfing members engaged in the game. You know, and, and, and I, no, I don't think it's in there, because it's called, where's the you in golf? One of the things that amazes me over the years is how many of us have a foursome that never changes. And so that new guy coming in, unless the pro staff is really being proactive, may not ever find that camaraderie that is supposed to be part of what our clubs are all about. And so the Country Club of Fairfax did several things. They did a junior program that was amazing. Got a team going locally. They, they had the kids in uniforms, and so they spree to court every time one of the kids would walk into the dining room with this uniform on, everybody would stand up and applaud. They did a three-holer group for the, for the ladies where Instead of being strict and stoic about golf, they'd do it at a time when nobody else was really on the golf course. They'd start with wine, uh, get them a little loosened up. They'd go out, play three holes, nobody was keeping score. Then they'd come back and drink a little more wine, and then they'd have to join, and the kids would join. And, and so it kind of made this in uh, a drunken mother, but a, a, a lot of fun family to do so. It seemed to have worked for them. And again, marketing is not the it's really not the purview of the membership committee. Do you know, I mean, if you, if you think back historically, membership committees were really formed to keep people up. And in some cases, it hasn't changed. I mean, I, I go to a lot of clubs like, well, I, I don't, you know, I, I think we should have a, a six-month vetting process because um, how would we know who they are? Well, let me get my computer here and in 20 seconds I can tell you the life history of this guy. Yeah, no, he's a good guy. He's all right. But yet we still want to hang to those traditions. And, you know, today's generation is not up to the Spanish Inquisition. Um, and it's not that we, we should reduce the vetting process. Vetting processes are important. It says to the world that not everybody can get in here. But I think they have to be reasonable, particularly reasonable in a climate in which you have limited golf. So let's say the, the season starts off in April or May, and I put in my application, oh, by the way, uh, your application will take four months to approve. Well, there's the season. So again, these are all commonsensical issues, um, but it's not the purview of the membership committee. How many of you have membership people, full-time membership people? Is it working out? Okay. Uh, we're seeing that be the standard today. People need to be encouraged, existing members need to be encouraged uh, to refer new members. The current referral rate in most clubs is less than 8%, which means that if you're losing 8% of your members on an annual basis, and you have 8% referrals, and you're only closing 25% of those that are referred, you're in, a, you're in trouble. You're in a deficit situation. And so if you're not having somebody that is focused in this stuff on a full-time basis, that's, that's driving existing members to drive traffic to the club, non-member traffic to the club, then you're backing up. Quit worrying about what the club down the street is doing. It's, you know, obviously, we're, we're all having difficulties today. It's, it's a time to really reflect on what we can do differently, how we can dare to be different, how we can set up to be successful not just tomorrow, but long term. We just recently did a project with Desert Mountain in which 
we were taking the transition from member owned or developer owned to member owned. And those of you who don't know what Desert Mountain is, it's six Nicholas courses in Scottsdale, six clubhouses, and a, a marvelous piece of property. And as part of our process, we, we took a group of HOA board members and we took a group of club board members and we took them around to nine of the top second home communities in the country. And the object of the, uh, the mission of the project was to see best practices, but also to define the difference between stability and sustainability. Have you ever thought about, I mean, has anyone ever thought about stability? Well, that means we're stable. You can be stable today and you can be gone tomorrow, just as that illustration showed just a second ago. And we found many things in the best practices of looking at these clubs that uh, suggest to us that we can't sit here today and expect everything to continue the way it is tomorrow, or it, it'll all change. What we, have to, what we have to do today is we have to look at our operations and we have to say, all right, what can be? And, and then again, have the courage to make that change. Communicate, communicate, Steve, but you know, this I didn't put this in just for you, but regular myth busting. How many clubs have a rumor mill coming out of the locker room? <laughs> we, we have great fun with this, where you have the, myth, the whole Mythbuster series that goes, goes out. And what better way to muzzle the mad dogs of the locker room? So I have a, a couple of things here I would recommend you read. Has anyone read Blue Ocean Strategy? How the Mighty Fall? How the Mighty Fall is, it, it's, it's almost written for golf. It, uh, it, it talks, and Jim Collins, of course, is, uh, it, is a great author, but the first thing he says in the stages of decline, the first stage is hubris. Do you think we have any of that in the private club industry? All right, anyway, I appreciate it. The industry is a crossroad. Do you have the courage to choose? Thank you all very much. Take any questions. I was actually uh, managed to finish an hour and a half presentation in 50 minutes. That's pretty good. Speed talk. Questions? I answered everything in the presentation, Jim. What's your position on incentivizing members to help improve members and financing errors and what's the bring in members? The question from Jay is uh, what's my view on incentivizing? to bring in new members. Uh, the reality of it is today that unless we find some way to engage our existing members in referring with less than 8% of them doing it on a natural basis, it isn't going to get done. There's two ways. One that, that I see in going forward. One is the incentivizing of the existing members and that can happen in a variety of different ways. You have to be very careful, obviously, but you also have to be you have to scrutinize that process to say, what would cause me to, to ask? If you go out and say, we're going to give you a free dinner for you and your wife, most people won't pick up a pen for that. So you've got to find out what's going to incentivize us to do it, and then offer that. The second part is, you really need to key in on those new members. They are probably 80% more likely to refer a new member than the, the existing member. And that's a, we call it the first 100 days. Staying engaged with those people over that first 100 days is incredibly important to the process. Steve? Hey, um, when you talked about your experience at the uh, montage, um, when we were doing the research on the food consumer and the trends and issues for private clubs, one of the things we found in a report that was just published about a month ago was that fluent consumers are about 50 or 60% more likely to give you personal information about themselves that will improve their experience. And it was it just a recent project it was from Nielsen. And it's to your point, when they asked you about that information about your wife and kids so that they could personalize the experience, you gave it to them. The members of, of these clubs are obviously willing to do the same thing because they fit into that study in that uh, of the food consumer. What do you find are ways that uh, clubs can really drill down to get that really detailed information on those individuals in that when they want to get things accomplished like re renovations and things of that nature? I'm going to try to paraphrase what Steve just said. Um, in a, a Nielsen study, it was they talked about the fact that um, 
the affluent were more likely to give information if it felt if they felt that that would enhance their um, their experience, and, and that was the montage uh, for us. And Steve was asking, how do we drill down into into that process into the private clubs? Well, the, the first I think the first answer to that, Steve, is this: it didn't cost cost the montage a single dime for that experience that myself and my family had. It didn't cost them a dime. It cost it cost them an idea, a concept, and a willingness a willingness and a courage to put it into place so that every time a guest arrives there, they're going through that experience. But there was no cost. They had the same personnel. There wasn't anything else other than a call, a call to me to get that to happen. And there's several ways, Steve, in terms of how do we get our members to, to get engaged. I think, first of all, it's incumbent upon us as clubs to kind of create the, the kinds of activities and things that we can do to allow members to bring them in, to bring guests in and showcase the club. And in some cases, don't even charge for the guests, but make it a point that you're, what you're doing is you're registering that guest so that it's, it's not a free, free ride every time they come in for something. But I think you have to find ways to generate non-member traffic into your club because the members aren't doing that. Uh, I think the other part of that is, is that you find ways to en en enhance the experience every time a potential member comes in so that uh, for example, I'm coming in as Steve as the membership director, and so he gets all this information from me before I come in. And as we're touring the club, he's taking me to only those places that, that mean something to me. And so we walk into the pro shop, and the, the pro knows that my two girls want to be involved in junior development golf. Uh, that's heartwarming to me. And then he says, you know, I have Rick, I understand you have a 36 handicap. Uh, you heard about our bridge club. That works. <laughs> yes. Are there too many golf clubs? Yes. yes. Are there too many golf clubs? And the answer is a, absolutely yes. It's it's mostly the advent of the daily fees that have contributed most greatly to our current issue. Um, but yes, very clearly we're overbuilt. We're, we lost just as a as in, uh, over the last five years we've closed 620 golf clubs. Private clubs? No, just total, total golf clubs. Some, there's probably about 8% of those are private. Yes? Uh, one of your slides earlier had that uh, older couple basically, basically saying, you know, bonus says me, uh, we're not going to use it in the future. Uh, I would guess that most clubs have had a similar experience where when you're trying to go forward and do something, there's this block of old members that are making noise and threatening to leave. And I wondered if there was a uh, yeah, that's a great. It's a great question. It, it, it was. A, it was about um, almost all clubs had that contingent of older members, and the slide said, you know, we don't buy green bananas. Um, you know, what's the statistics of those that would actually follow through on the promise that they quit if there was an assessment? I don't know that that exists because there's there's a demographic differential in each club and, and you know the dues and all the rest of the variables in there would, would conjure up a whole myriad of different responses. But I would say this to you that when you looked at that one slide that showed Paige was in a bell curve. It wasn't um, in your package. It wasn't perfect. The graphics on the screen were not necessarily the same as in your package. Oh, they were? No. You had ski slopes in the package and Oh, I have the ski slopes. It was, it was in my head. On the age distribution. Let me see if I can find the right slide here that we're talking about. That one. Yeah. yeah. This. Those are different in your presence. Mm Hard -hmm. copy. Anyway, the, the slide that showed the ages. I don't know where it went. Um, I think fundamentally what we're experiencing today is a lot of the older people today have memberships in the South uh, or they've got some second homes that they're, they're at. And just as we are beginning to try to figure out how to bring our younger members to, to grow with our club, I think in some uh, small way we need to begin to think about how we gracefully give our seniors a similar opportunity rather than lose them. And I'm not suggesting that we lower their dues by half. We did see a club in Rockford, Illinois, that did that several years ago. That if you achieved a certain age, your dues got um, 
to half, and, and by the time they realized they had a problem, over 50% of the membership was in that senior category and trying to get a vote to change it was a very difficult process, as you might imagine. So, but I do think that we, be, we need to, to think in the club of the future because so many of our members are aging, and they will leave us if we don't have some way for them to, to step down to a secondary membership and or freeze them in their dues and or assessments, and if there's any kind of equity, which most of you don't have, you can take that back. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Craig, one of the things that uh, you've never addressed over the years, when these clubs close, uh, frequently you have bands of people traveling from closed clubs to new clubs. And uh, they come to a club and, and are looking for some type of admissions offer. Do mm -hmm. uh, you have any thoughts about that? The, the question is, is, is we see clubs that are closing, obviously there becomes then a non-migration of members from that club to other clubs, and in the traditional process is they're coming over to you saying, let's make a deal. Um, and I think depending upon the club that you are and how you've maintained yourself over the, over the, it's about integrity to me. You know, once you lower the initiation fee at your club, as, as any of you who have done that, realize it's going to be very, very difficult to ever get it back to that level. So when you make that kind of a deal, I, I think it has to be structured uh, in such a way that it, it doesn't necessarily destroy your own integrity. Now, I, I could be a club that has already destroyed my integrity, so then, okay, I'll take you in, it's great. But if I maintain my pricing, I think I'd be very careful about making that deal. Any other questions? Enjoy the, the golf. <laughs> <laughs>